Greetings and thank you for joining us at futuremoneytrends.com. I have a very special guest. Uh, he is the author of Gold Value and Gold Prices, 1971 to 2021. Uh, Gary Christensen, I had the pleasure of meeting him at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium. I want to say it was uh, early or, or uh, uh, yeah, probably early 2014. He's a great guy, uh, well-researched. So if you're interested in precious metals today or just uh, cruising along on iTunes or, or YouTube and, and stumbled upon our channel, uh, this is a great uh, interview to listen to to learn about the investment opportunity uh, for gold and silver. Gary, thank you so much for joining us. Well, good morning. Thank you very much. Yeah, I also want to mention your website. If people like to go to your website, it's Deviant Investor. Uh, and we'll have that definitely at the bottom of... Uh, both our YouTube channel and the iTunes account. So if you guys want, uh, just check out DeviantInvestor.com. Now, how often do you post on your um, on your blog? Typically, I only post about twice a week. Okay. Well, there you go. Twice a week, and uh, you can get the latest update. He does a lot of research, people. So definitely something you want to check out. Uh, Gary, let's start off with... with uh, we're going to get this interview probably out in the next 24, 48 hours. So just to let everybody know, this interview is being done before the Fed decision is announced. Um, so show us a little love if uh, if we're not exactly uh, on, on how things play out. But interest rates rising. Here's my speculation, Gary, and please uh, let me know what your thoughts are. You know, just as everybody thought gold and silver would go up on QE and all these low rates, but they've done the opposite. I'm kind of sitting here wondering if everybody's worried about rates killing gold if they go up. I'm wondering if rates, uh, interest rate increase could be the trigger for a new gold bar, new gold bull market. What do you think? Well, okay, I I have several thoughts on that. First off, I think you could be correct. Um, I would lean in that direction. Um, I would qualify that by saying, I've been very I've been very suspicious of gold and silver prices uh, for the last six seven years as not representing physical demand and not representing um, the real need for them in the in the economy, but more representing the need for paper manipulation of those prices. And we all know that paper prices are pretty well set on COMEX, and yet somehow prices are going down as demand worldwide is going up. So I'm very suspicious of prices representing the real physical situation out there. Um, in fact, I've had uh, just read an article um, about um, a Swiss uh, refiner making that comment that physical prices don't represent or a physical demand doesn't represent the prices. So back to that point then, we expected gold and silver prices to rise when QE was announced and in fact they went down. Um, could very well be exactly the opposite here. Both gold and silver prices by any measure are terribly oversold. They've been down really hard for a long, long time. Um, in fact, one of my most recent articles here, I just compare the price of silver, um, actually a combination of crude oil and silver because I figure that's representative of commodities, over 100 years to national debt and to the S&P. And if you look at those graphs um, posted on my site this morning, we're clearly at historical lows in terms of the ratios. But if you look at the graph of crude and silver for 100 years, they're clearly just going up in a in a increasing prices. We increase debt, we increase money in circulation, we increase commodity prices on average. And then every so often, like the last four and a half years, we crash silver down. What that leads into to me is, I think we're at an inflection point here, and when I say here, I mean in terms of months, not in terms of days. Looks to me like the bond market is quite high and due to come down. Looks to me like the stock market peaked back in May and has been flopping around, rolling over and rallying back. To me, it's at an inflection point where it very well could turn down for several years. And gold and silver, as you suggested, could be turning up. And the news event that could mark that point would be the Federal Reserve comment for tomorrow. So that's my thoughts on it. Um, no way to prove any of that, but that's what the charts show me. You know what interests me about silver, uh, and I'm glad you brought up the, the demand, not you know equating to what's going on with the, with the price. But you mm -hmm. know, right now we have silver mines shutting down, uh, zinc mines, which produce a lot of silver, 
uh, shutting down copper mines, which produce a lot of silver, shutting down. Uh, exploration's been halted for years now, essentially. Uh, yet the, the the physical demand continues to surge higher. You, any offset of, of of any slowdown in solar or industrial anything, investment demand just surges. And I think silver is unique in that sense because even if uh, in, if industrial ma- demand gets weak for zinc, let's say uh, it, the 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 zinc um, the demand is weak and the supply can go down with demand. With silver, we got supply going down. Certainly the future pipeline of supply going down, but the demand just is relentless. And I guess my my question is, is with the physical silver demand being so high and now we have real uh, coming shortages, real d- uh, supply being off the market with major zinc mines closing down, primary silver producers producing less silver. Um, do you think silver will just completely blow out and outshine gold when this thing does turn around. Well, I do. And, the, of course, the key point is when this thing does turn around. But if you – and, and my, my indication for this is look at the ratio of gold to silver or look at the, the opposite, the silver to gold ratio. People typically think in terms of gold to silver and – that ranges anywhere from say 15 to 1 up to say 100 to 1 and right now it's um, oh somewhere in the 70 80 range um, when silver prices are low that ratio is high like right now and when i say silver prices are low i mean both in an absolute sense and in a relative sense compared to the price of gold so the other way to say this is when silver prices drop, they drop more rapidly than gold. And when they rally, they rally more rapidly than gold. And so a ratio could move from, say, 80 to 1 to 40 to 1. Gold prices could go up a factor of 2, and silver prices could go up a factor of 4. And that, I believe, is what will happen. And it has been happening for at least 45 years. When silver prices rally, they will rally much more rapidly than gold, and when they fall, they'll fall much more rapidly than gold. And we've seen that in the last uh, four and a half years since the peaks in 2011, and we certainly saw that in the lead up to the peak in 2011. And back to that point, if you look at it on the charts, and to look at it in terms of ratios to the S&P, ratios to the Dow, ratios to the NASDAQ, ratios to the national debt, silver got way ahead of itself in terms of pricing in April of 2011, and since then it's crashed. And so it went up way too far, way too fast, and now it's come down way too far and way too fast. And my belief, and I've stated this in my blog several times, is that silver is going to hit $100 sometime in the next few years probably five years as a as a wild guess and in that time it will have gone up a factor of say seven from where we're at now and gold may be up a factor of two three or four from there and to me that is so logical because we're just increasing debt and increasing money in circulation like there's no tomorrow and eventually that money will flop back into commodity prices and into something that protects from the loss of purchasing power. And what protects best is gold and silver. That's that's my thought on it. Uh, you've done considerable research for your book, Gold Value and Gold Prices, and uh, as well as your blog. Many, many people uh, ask myself, and I'm sure they ask you a thousand times more, when, 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 when. So let me flip the question around. What could keep prices down and what could what could push prices down further for the next, say, two, three, four years? Well, you know, if you look at that and the, the primary thing to me is a deflationary collapse that is not followed up by massive central bank money printing. If we had a deflationary collapse, and let's just suppose that the central banks lose control of things and governments lose control of things, the stock market crashes substantially, the bond market crashes, and the central banks do not step in and print trillions of dollars, trillions of pounds, trillions of yen to try to support and and levitate the bubble, then I would think that gold and silver, at least initially, could even go down further. And then eventually they will realize that, hey, all the money we have is devaluing and it's devaluing rapidly and we're losing in 
stocks we're losing in bonds, let's put it into something that's going to retain its value. And throughout history, that has been gold and silver. So I would think that if you want to look at what could cause prices to go down much further, it's a devastating devaluation, I mean, a devastating deflationary collapse across the world that the central banks have lost control over and can't can't correct. And I don't know how to put the probability on that, but it seems to me like that's a possibility. Certainly, they're going to fight that. They may not succeed, but they'll certainly fight it. Well, yeah, I mean, for a lot of reasons, they have no choice but to fight it, right? But doesn't it seem like that may be happening right now as we speak? You've got, um, I think, about half the global markets are down 10% or more. Commodities are just being, I mean, just it's stunning what's happening to commodities. I mean, just across the board, just being smashed to smithereens. Um, isn't it possible that we are already in the midst of a major deflationary uh, crisis? Well, and in res- in that respect, yes. And if you look at commodities, certainly something like a forty year low in this um, the CBRE, you know, it, the, um, the the commodity index. Um, I'm looking at a headline, an article here right now. Um, I think this is put out by Phoenix Capital. The fuse on the global debt bomb has been lit. The global bond bubble has begun bursting. This process will not be fast by any means. And, you know, his thesis is that um, bonds will come down the way bonds have been in a 35 year bull market and they are going to correct and they're going to come down hard. And, um, his his point and his I think this is relative to bonds, but it could also be relative to gold and silver. Although I think that only relative to gold and silver for a very short period of time. My point with all this is that even when the bubble was both very specific and obvious, the collapse was neither quick nor clean. And we've had, it, one could argue, a boost up in the price of silver and gold into 2011, and then they crashed down. And my thought would be it's about time that that bubble crash um, moves over into other things. And at this point, I think it's stocks and bonds, and it could be time for the gold and silver to reverse. Uh, my inclination is they're so far oversold now, they haven't got much more downside, but you never know. No, I know. I uh, I bought silver when it bottomed at 30 and 20 and and now 15, so. <laughs> and now 15, yes, and it could, you know, there's nothing that says it can't go to 13, but my overall point is we're not trading silver in the on the COMEX. We're not trading paper products. We're trying to buy value, something that's valuable not just in two or three months, which is a very def- difficult game to estimate, but something that's going to be valuable in three or four years. And to me, it's it's rather obvious that silver and gold will maintain their value, maintain their purchasing power, and we're better off having money into silver and gold today than we are having money in a checking account or money in um, um, an S&P index fund. And if you look at it from the long term, gold and silver seem to be the higher probability bet. Now, Gary, the, mi- the gold mining shares are essentially down about 90%. They're down like, I think it's like 85, 86% on the TSX venture, but it's 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 priced in Canadian dollars, and a lot of people don't factor that in. In 2011, Canadian dollar and the US dollar were about par. Now it's about a 20, 25% discount. So, I mean, in real terms, these things are down 90% or more in some cases. And we're talking producers too. We're talking about real companies. Um, do you do you at all invest in the mining shares, or do are you attracted to those at all? Um, I like to follow them. Um, I followed them and I invested in them going on the way up to 2011. I kind of lost interest after 2011. But if you just look at the GDX, which is a um, an ETF of gold mining shares, um, that's down uh, today. It's somewhere around. Um, let's see. Um, Today is somewhere around 13, and it had been around 65. So, you know, that's down about 80%. That's in U.S. dollars. That's down about 80%. And that's another indication that gold and silver prices have been hammered because the share prices go down even more rapidly than silver does. When those prices turn, when the gold and silver stock prices turn, I'll f- interpret that as a very good indication that gold and silver prices themselves have turned. And the actual low that I show on my charts here for the GDX 
occurred in September of 2015, so a couple months ago, but it's only barely above that right now. Um, it looks to me like it's building a base down there at, at this $13, $14 range, but who knows? But my thought is that it should be building a base there, and it should start moving upward. And it could be that some of the money that will leave more traditional stocks will move into gold and silver stocks because at this point, they represent quite good value. Yeah. You know, on, on the downside, do you do anything to hedge your gold and silver position? No. And obviously, in retrospect, I wish I had, but I have done nothing to hedge it. I've just been looking at it as a very long-term um, protect my purchasing power investment. And um, so I'm not the person to talk to about hedging because I didn't personally do it. That's okay. You, you've showed a you know considerable amount of data and, and your blog and your research uh, at deviantinvestor.com for why gold and silver are trading at such extremes. And I've seen some, some stuff with the mining companies as well and the precious metals, specifically on your site, where it is it is just ridiculous. I mean, this is seems like one of those moments in your life where, look, you might not be, you know, I'll give you an example. Rick Rule just told me straight up a few weeks ago. He's like, I don't know if it's going to turn around in a week or a year or two years or three years. He goes, but when it does, these things are so beaten down. He says, you can't but not make 10 times your money. Um, the world, uh, Gary, uh, it's there's a lot of things going on. You've got here in the U.S., um, you got the election news, uh, which is kind of constant because of uh, Donald Trump's entrance into the race. Uh, you've got wars potentially with Russia and Turkey and the U.S. messing around with the Chinese Chinese in the, in the South Sea. And then again, we've talked about the markets melting down, this rate increase coming in a few days here as we do this, or tomorrow actually now. What are your uh, expectations? Uh, you do a lot of research. I know you are definitely a gold and silver expert, but um, so we're not going to hold you to anything on, on geopolitics, but I'd love to get your opinion because you, you do filter through so much news and information and research. What are your expectations of 2016? Do you think this is the year of war or a Lehman Brothers moment? Where are we going? <laughs> well, okay, with with that introduction, um, and let me qualify this by saying, uh, over the past many years, I have been um, more biased towards silver and gold, and more biased against um, stock and bond investments, and for the last several years, that hasn't been very productive. When I started buying silver and gold back about 15 years ago, it has been productive, so it depends on your time schedule. So given that I'm inclined to be more supportive of gold and silver um, and the long-term purchasing power that they represent, uh, what I view for 2016, and this is just my view, I view 2016 as increasing war. Um, and as all the areas you mentioned, I'm very worried about what's happening in Syria. And I'm very worried that there's um, forces moving about over there that are pushing the world toward a world war um, for their benefit but not to, and to the detriment of many other countries. And I'm f afraid that the forces that are involved over there um, are worried about what's good for them and not worried about what's good for the countries and people. But, oh, you know, we can't go down that rabbit hole very far. Um, I see 2016 as much more war, much more focus on that. Uh, Larry Edelson's done a lot on war cycles, and I think his cycles point to uh, increasing war forces until about 2020. Um, I buy into and agree with his analysis on that. I see 2016 as a period of time for stocks being down and bonds being down, and uh, lots of increased volatility. and. The craziness of the election, the craziness of, of things going on in Syria and the South China Sea and Iraq. I mean, we weren't supposed to have boots on the ground, and now we've got 3,500 people in Iraq, the last I read. Um, it just seems to me like the process is expanding, and the process by that I mean of the massive amount of debt and, and leverage in the world and the risk and the potential of a meltdown um, in stock and bond markets is huge. And it could parallel the meltdown that we've seen in the gold and silver markets or the gold and silver stocks in the last four or five years. Uh, to me, the risk is very high for lots of bad things to happen, which is another reason why I feel good about having money in gold and silver, because they're going to maintain the purchasing power 
better than some other investments. Timing on this, very difficult, but I think that uh, 2016 points to more risk, more volatility, and a lot more concern for any paper-related assets. Gary Christensen of the Deviant Investor, author of Gold Value and Gold Prices, 1971 to 19 or 2021. Uh, excuse me, uh, Gary. Thank you so much for being on the show. I felt like this was a, a conversation we could have had at a, a local coffee shop, and I love these type of interviews. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, hope to talk to you soon. Maybe we can do uh, an early 2016 video, sir. Thanks again. S- sounds great. Thank you.